The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. Schroeder's is a global asset and wealth manager with broad expertise across public and private markets, investing on behalf of individuals, institutions and advisors. We support advisors to help their clients build successful portfolios to achieve their goals, whatever they may be. We are proud to be partnering with Ensemble to host a dedicated investment space on the Ensemble platform to have more meaningful conversations with their clients and to give advisors a more efficient way to engage with Schroeder's. Join the Schroeder's investment space on the Ensemble platform today. Hello, welcome back to another episode. Today I'm joined by Tony Smilevsky. Uh Tony, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me, James. Appreciate you reaching out the other day to uh, to have a chat. I'd actually seen you um, some of your stuff popping up on LinkedIn over the last little while, and then you you put the odd the odd post up written or or, or otherwise. Uh, so I'd seen your name popping up a bit, and then and then you reached out to say that want to do a podcast, which will which will be great. I'm um, you yeah, keen to understand the space that you're working in, so thanks for joining me again. Thank you for having me. Maybe yep. if we start like we tend to with with most most guests, you know, a bit about your journey in in financial advice. Maybe what are you doing at the moment? Maybe why don't we start there? So, you, so you run your own business. Tell us about your own business, and then we'll go back a bit. Yeah, running my own business, uh, selling retail life insurance, the exact same product all financial advisors would be selling. Yep. Uh, as an authorized representative, not as a financial advisor. That's that's where the current business sits. My background uh, when I started in the industry was providing general advice back when it was a, a, a very different play f- playing field back in 2012 and, and moving on from there. Um, I moved into, after about four years or so of that, I moved into providing financial advice as a risk specialist. Uh, that was about the time when the Royal Commission began. Yep. And then at the time of the recommendations and, and the changes that were happening because of the Royal Commission, I stepped into business or partnership with uh, business accountants and another financial advisor where we where I was providing the risk insurance piece advice. Yep. Uh, and after a few years of that, the changes that everyone saw, the hurdles that were put in front of us from the compliance requirements, it meant that, and like a lot of other advisors would would relate, that it wasn't profitable to be running a risk-only specialist uh, business in our scenario. you There's a lot of advisors obviously out there doing it very successfully and, and kudos to them, great work. But for the majority of us, uh, it, it meant that we either had to be providing holistic advice or find another way to, to provide risk advice, and that was by charging a fee. And with our uh, business, the model that we had in place meant that holistic advice in the business that we set up for the risk insurance wasn't an option uh, as the clients were already clients of the firm that were receiving advice in some form. Uh, charging a fee also wasn't really an option because they were already paying fees and the majority of the clients that we were dealing with at the time uh, and even now that I deal with that are referred to me from that firm, those clients aren't looking to receive advice necessarily. They're looking to just have some product put in place. They've got their advice team. They've got their direction that they're heading in. Uh, they're semi-professional, professional already, running their own business on a high level, so they're not interested in receiving the advice piece around the insurance because they've already re- received it in some sense. Gotcha. Yep. So, th- so that business that you said you know, it didn't work out to be profitable. Were you were you doing insurance advice on a, on a commissions basis, and then the, the tapering down of how those commissions worked it meant it wasn't profitable to continue in this current form. Pretty much, yeah. yeah so yeah. it wasn't it wasn't profitable 
And in the main hurdle being the compliance that was required to be ticked off to get the advice out there, uh, we, we did our best to uh, streamline that process and make it as efficient as possible. But being a small practice, not having all of the resources that we could put into it and I guess a bit of a timing factor of starting it at the time that the commission started to drop down yeah. might not have played into our hands very well. Yep. Uh, hence hence why I give kudos to those businesses that do do it profitably, especially off commission only these days because yeah, they've had the ability to do that. But again, you know, it doesn't always work for everyone else. Yep. So, so what, do, what does your current business look like at the moment then? What's the setup there and, and how are you operating? So the current business, uh, after all of all of this, there was a lot of other advisors that ended up in the same boat. So for my decision, it was based off uh, vi- whether it was viable or not to continue on in that direction. For a lot of other businesses, there may have been also education requirements that they fell short on um, and, and other decisions that came with that. So for me, I, I passed my FASIA exam, uh, the second exam they ever had, sat down with my business partner we got it done got started on the education requirements which were getting ticked off so everything was fine uh, but then I noticed that a lot of my peers or my colleagues were struggling in the same uh, in the same environment they they had all these clients they had all this business and it was a little bit frustrating at the same time COVID had hit and that was early 2020 and um, I'm, I sat back and thought there's no point in in continuing a business that's not working in the sense that it needs to as a business. So what are my options out there? And I explored the general advice path, uh, not to not be compliant. A lot of advisors have this perception that general advice is a way to avoid providing advice. The reality is general advice is there to provide product only. To clients, okay. it's there. Uh, the the perception they have that general advice is not possible. Funny enough, is correct because as an advisor, you can't not provide advice to a client that's come to you to seek advice. You can't say oh, I'm not providing you advice. They'll always be under the perception that they're receiving advice. So it's a catch twenty two. The only solution to that to make it clear to a client is to not be an advisor in the first instance. Hence why that step to the side to say, okay, well, I'm no longer authorized on the financial advisor register. I'm just an authorized representative with ASIC. Uh, I'm licensed to provide retail insurance products. So it's a limited license and that's all I do. So now I operate as support to existing advice businesses. Because of this void that was created by advisors leaving whether it be for compliance reasons or profitability or whatever the case may have been or or education, there was a void left where people wanted insurance, but they didn't want advice. By people, I mean our our clients. Gotcha, yep. And a big part of the Australian population that isn't interested in receiving advice, but wants the more uh, direct service. They don't want to go online. They don't want to uh, be told, you know, Here's, here's an option to click a button and you'll have insurance. They want someone they can ask a question to. They know they're getting factual information. And at the same time, they know that if they do want advice, they have someone they can be referred to, which would be their financial planner that they came from. Yep. To give a scenario um, that, that I see often is a client that would be looking for advice would go to their to find an advisor that have been, that has been recommended by someone that's happy they received the advice. They sit down, tell them what they want. You know, oh, we just organized our mortgage. We want to have a million dollar life cover policy, maybe some total disability, whatever that conversation might be. And the advisor looks at that and says, okay, well, there's about a $1,000 commission in there. Uh, so we charge a base fee of, let's say, you know, minimum three and a half thousand. Yep. And the client looks at them and says, well, Why am I paying that when all I want to do is cover this mortgage? And traditionally, they would be sent off to fend for themselves in a sense. Yep. That's where I stepped in as an alternative to the online um, option or an alternative to them going elsewhere where the advisor says, look, 
based off our initial discussion, you require a product, but you don't at this stage require advice. So we we work with in partnership in a sense with Tony Insurance. Tony can organize that policy for you. There's no advice there. There's no fees being charged. It's just commission only model. Yep. So if you need advice or if you require any specific services, you're welcome to come back to us. Now, mind you, this only works if it's just insurance. Uh, you know, with the you know the fascia code that if you can provide the service, you must provide the service. Yeah, exactly. To paraphrase. So if a client comes to you, uh, and I get this question often from advisors, they say, okay, well, if I do the investment piece, can you just do the insurance part? And I, and I tell them, no, we can't do that because you're not meeting your obligation there to provide all of those services. So it, it's a matter of understanding what I do and where I sit because I'm not in competition with advisors. Uh, yeah. No one providing general advice can compete with an advisor. We don't provide that service. What we actually compete with is the uh, online uh, channels. So where, you know, if, if you happen to be an online business providing all insurances with a call center, that's who my competitor is. So your your decision as an advisor or if there was an accountant out there or mortgage broker, their decision is, do I send this client to uh, online to buy their insurance and hope that the call center person does right by them? Or do I send it to someone that I have a personal relationship uh, with and professional relationship that I know will tick those boxes and keep me in the loop if we need anything or if that client needs advice, they're not going to be referred to some other advisor. If they need another service, they're not going to be referred to some other third party. So if I, so if, we, if we talk through, like so, so if, I, if I play the advisor and the, the, the traditional financial advisor, so as, as you said, we know we have a Due to do, if, if if we identify a need for something, even though it might not be necessarily what they've come in asking for, but in in the in the financial advice process, we identify a need, and any in, in, you know, insurance is a is is a pretty typical one with a lot of the clients that I work with. They're not coming in saying, "Hey, James, help me work out how much insurance I need and what what the appropriate product is and how I should you know pay for it or hold it or, or what." That's often being driven by me as we go through. And the uh, the initial engagement with the client and say, hey, hang on, you know, you've got a bit of insurance in your super fund here, but you've got this mortgage. We're talking about buying this thing or doing that thing, and we need to look at it. Do you, do, do you want some help with it? And so then then the onus is on me to do a whole needs analysis of how much insurance should they have, how should they hold it, which policies should they be looking at, and and all the rest of it. And I get you know there's limited commissions on the other side unless someone's paying for it for it up front. So if if, if that client comes into me and I identify a need. This isn't so much about outsourcing that fulfillment of that need to you, as as you just said, is it? No, not at no. all. Yeah. So how does my client that comes in to see me for James? I'm 45 years old. I work for this tech company. I've got all of these RSUs vesting. My home loan, this, that, the other. In the mix of that, we identify there's a need for insurance. I have to deal with that myself. How in that process do you get involved, or do you get involved at all? Where does that fit? That's the most common confusion that comes about with advisors. And yeah. it's understandable, right? Because the clients come to you for advice and they describe their situation. You've identified needs. Uh, that is not the client that comes to us. Yep. So the, the clients, again, that come to us are the clients that before you do any of that, you identify they're not a fit for your practice. Yep. There's no advice. They're not interested in paying a fee uh, or the commission component that if you're a commission-only practice isn't enough to cover your fees where you identify from the initial discussion prior to going into any detail what their expectations of you are as, a, as their advisor uh, and, and say, okay, well, you just need an insurance product at this stage or you just need... Um, the cover that you need doesn't seem like it would be enough to cover our fees or you don't want to pay fees, okay, for the time being, you'd be better suited going to just buy the product over here. When you're ready, then you can come to us and go through that process. And gotcha. that's where we sit. We, we are the, I'd say the first step, the ground level, be it yep. not even the first step of the advice 
staircase. And so, and so when you you're saying to like, there, there's no advice. You're not you're not providing advice. H- how is it that someone has a million dollars of life insurance, half a million dollars, or five million dollars worth of life insurance? Where does that number come from? Great question. So that 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 again, from an advice standpoint, is very contentious and confusing to everybody involved because yeah. to determine a figure, it requires a conversation, and it's a conversation of what the client needs. The difference between general advice and personal advice is what the client needs versus what the client wants. So when they come to us, we don't ask them what they uh, what their needs are, what their situation is. We uh, obviously we don't consider any of those things. Those things, uh, all we ask, the only question we ask is, "What do you want?" And the Could client you? says, "A common a common response is, I don't know, right?" And that's where the difference can become very great. However, the right process and understanding your obligations, right, uh, and the, the right compliance regime in place will make sure you're working to the right standard. So whenever clients ask that question of, oh, I'm not too sure, it's always about what they want. So we go back to that and say, okay, well, look, if ideally you were to put something in place, what would that amount be? Let's have a look at what the options are, and then you can work backwards or add more if you want from there. Now, everyone has a rough figure in their head. With each product, we ask them the exact same question. So they can um and ah, they, they can choose different figures, but it's always making sure that they're directing the conversation rather than the advice way of us directing the conversation. And I feel yeah. like I'm a little bit better equipped in some instances to do that because I've gone through the advice part. Uh, and being an advisor, so I know what I do as an advisor. Uh, so every every time I have a conversation with a client, I just do the opposite. And I always say, I always say to advisors, if you're using your brain as a general advisor, if you're thinking, you're doing it wrong. You shouldn't be thinking. <laughs> you let the client do the thinking. You just do the key uh, entering and, and factual information providing. So when they do ask the question of, okay, well, what is a what is a um, uh, Re- trauma reinstatement. You know, what, what does trauma cover? You can give them the factual response of what the insurers provided as uh, what trauma covers, what the general definition around trauma is, uh, some general statistics so they've got a concept of what they're looking at. But again, you're not promoting products, you're not selling products, you're not advising the client to purchase a product. If you take it to step one, you'll know you don't have to do that because they've called you to buy a specific product. So I don't need to talk to them about double buyback on life with TPD owned through super. I don't need to go through that spiel because the client's called me for something. Yep. I just need to implement their request. So how do you decide then, or how does the client decide? Because it's, you know, it's, it's not you giving the advice. The client's making a decision or they're telling you what they want. So I guess it, so the, the first part is, how much insurance do they want? The second part might be how are they going to own that? Whether they pay it themselves, whether they have some through super, whether it's half half, you know, what whatever. How is a client making that decision? Good question. Where, where, how does that part come come into the conversation? Good question. You and I both have young kids. Uh, picture lunchtime <laughs> with with your toddler. If you start asking them. And giving them options and fifty different options of what they want or what's a, what's on the table, they don't just need get anything. everything <laughs> thrown in your face and no decision, right? <laughs> so it's a matter of giving uh, exactly what they've asked for in the first instance and staying on message. So okay. I don't need to introduce concepts uh, when they say, for example, I want some life insurance and I want uh, some total disability cover, right? I can ask them, okay, well, what what do you ideally want? We'll come up with a round figure. Uh, I'll let them know, okay, based off what you've requested, the approximate premiums about you know, starting from $1,000 per annum. And I'll, I'll be met with a response. Oh, okay, that's a bit more expensive than I thought, or whatever it might be. We can determine a figure that way based off a premium. Mm-hmm. It's not discussed as a decision maker. But the client directs that conversation when they see, you know, oh, I'd, ideally I'd like five million of total disability. Okay, client, Mr. Client, well, that's going to be 
you know, ten thousand dollars per annum. Oh no way, I'm paying that. Oh, that's way too expensive. Okay, well, if we were to reduce it, what would you want the other figure to be? Well, let's try two million. Oh, that's still expensive. Let's try one million. Oh, that's still expensive. So they'll make a decision of what's important to them. Uh, exactly in the way when you when you can, uh, do a needs analysis, you'll determine what's important to them, what they want to cover, uh, how to discuss the price. We don't ask those questions, but we just lead into those questions based off their responses. So if they're not concerned about price, I'm not concerned about price. Yep. When it comes to more technical questions like, would you want to pay for this out of your superannuation? Should it be half-half? What's the ownership? What's the uh, any or own occupation? Those are questions we pose to the client as part of our uh, checkboxes, as, as our script. So we have to discuss the options. We let them know what those options are, uh, and then we let them make the decision. So in the superannuation instance, it's you have an option that you can pay for this premium out of your superannuation, or you can pay for it out of your own pocket. So you might have experience with this where your, your current cover or you might have previously had cover, might have been owned through super. Um, you know, if they, if they have or haven't, they can ask a question. We can give them a factual response. And then they'll tell us, you know, oh, I'd, li- I'd like to pay for this out of my own pocket. And I don't need to ask why. I don't need to get into specifics. One thing to note uh, in this whole discussion is this client's most likely come to me referred from an advisor and they weren't all advice for whatever reason. Yes. So if I'm having this discussion and the client's giving me signals that they have zero idea about what they want, they've got zero idea about what they're comfortable with, we're not there to sell a product, we're there to execute their request. So if they're really stuck, I'll bring that conversation back up and say, look, you've, uh, you're really not sure, that doesn't seem to be making too much sense to you. I know that James referred you for me to get this product in place for you, but I really think you you need to speak to James to go down the advice path because you're going to make some decisions that you're definitely not going to be happy with. Yeah. And you're going to end up canceling in in and in that instance you would have spent your money for nothing. And that's a that's an easy conversation to have. So it's almost a, it's almost what what what's it's all starting to make sense in my in my head. So I appreciate the explanation, but it, it it's sounding like it's almost like and we'll get we'll get to product. I've got a question about how do you decide which product look from which insurance provider. We'll get to that one in a minute. But when it comes to like you referred to this kind of ticker box in your process, it's it's almost the bit that's standing out in my head. It's almost like you've got the application open with the client on your computer and they're sitting there and you're helping them, you know, as you, as you go through the application, you've got different boxes for different options about add ons and this thing and that thing and ownership and and how you want to pay for it. It's like you're just helping. It's almost as if you're just helping them fill in the application form. Would, exactly. Would, would that be a fair? It's maybe not the process, but would that be a, a fair assumption if I was trying to get it to make sense in my head? I, yeah, I haven't put it that way, but I like that. It, yeah. it is very accurate that it, that is exactly what we do. We just go through that, and again, we're the alternative to you sending them to a call center. Yeah. To do the exact same process. Which, yeah, true. The person on the call center is just going to help them complete the application anyway, aren't they? Exactly, and they're and they're employed to just do exactly that. We're yeah. we're here to build a relationship with the advisor. It's and so the, the the product piece. You know, there's half a dozen or however many insurance companies there are out there in the marketplace. Yep. How's the client deciding where which insurance company they want to go with? What what's what's driving that decision? In my experience, it's always price. Yep. When I say always, I'll say 99%. I have had clients say to me, I haven't heard of uh, these ones, not to mention names. And funny enough, they're the biggest insurers in Australia, but I have heard of this one here. Okay. And, and they'll go a little further down the list. I'd be more comfortable there. Again, I'm not uh, there to tell them what to do. One question I get often, and this is I, I always like explaining this to advisors, is the client says, well, there's 10 of them on this list. Which one should I go with? And I have to I have to answer that question, right? And it has to be factual and not influence their decision. So I explain to them, okay, well, all of the insurers on the list contain the benefit amounts and parameters that you've requested. So is there anything specific that you're 
looking to have with this policy that I can, uh, you know, have a look and provide you the PDS or the wording? Or are you happy with the parameters that you've set? And they go, oh, there's nothing specific. Oh, well, okay. They all have everything that you've asked for uh, on this as we were preparing the quote. Uh, so we've just arranged them for you from cheapest to most expensive. Yeah. So which one would you like to proceed with? So do you do you this list? You know, so they've said to you, I want half a million dollars of life and total disability insurance. You do your quotes somehow in your in, in your process, and you put this list in front of them. Do you have in do you have in that list? Does it just say insurance company A, B, C, and D, or does it have the name of the insurance provider? and then the associated cost with that insurance provider. So they, they're provided, so initially they're provided uh, with the, you know, FSG privacy policy links to the PDSs from just an initial welcome email. Yep. And then post that, when we're having the discussion with the client, we email them what, the estimates of all of the insurers, which will contain the insurer's name, uh, product I'm just trying to remember. So they've got the logo, the yep. insurer's name, the premium, and if there's a breakdown. So we're using, just to premise all of that as well, we're using the a, a popular comparison tool software. So it's not X, like... X plant? No. Is it plant or not? Oh, no. No, but, but you can, uh, I don't, from my, having used X plan previously, risk researcher, the, the view that you're picturing with X plan risk yeah. researcher is the same. You gotcha. So yep. that's what the client is seeing in a sense when we send it to them and they're seeing the estimates of all the insurers and they're making a decision based off whatever it is they want to make a decision off. That obviously includes the PDSs. So there's no specific ticks and crosses to sway their decision one way or the other. It's just, here's the information. You ask me what you want to know yep. and I'll provide you with that factual information. Gotcha. And, and do you have to go, you say, so you've got any of this kind of limited license that you're explaining right right at the start, do you have the same auditing obligations and, and all the rest of it that, that other financial advisors have to, to go through from licensees? Like what, what does all of that look like in the, in the, you know, I guess in the back office for you? Yeah, great question. As a general advice business, we take our compliance and auditing obligations very seriously, even though, as like you put it, we have a limited license. My current licensee has a very robust compliance process and it uses a digital solution to make sure that nothing falls through the cracks. Part of that includes that, um, you know, they've got a dedicated compliance person listening to our recorded calls, as well as checking each individual file. Yeah, it, look, it, it sounds. I can sound. I don't know. It sounds like it. It sounds like a great option. I don't. You've. You know that in the half hour that we've been, that we've been chatting, and you've convinced me about the. You know the, the the place that you that you can you kind of fit in in the whole advice landscape of you know full full advice at one end, and we're in this world of of you know someone's come in asking for this thing, but because we have a duty to uncover, you know, ask some deeper questions and go back and do some research and then we're often having to uh, you know, prepare advice that covers off on all of these different things that have, uh, in, at least in the first instance, nothing to do with what the client might have come in asking for in the first place. Uh, and, and you know, at least in our, in, in our business here, insurance is that real sticking point that we do some insurance advice and we're not, we're not a, a risk-only business. So, you know, so, so getting through that insurance advice piece is probably the hardest part in our whole process, I, I would think. Pre-assessments, underwriting, the advice, you know, getting the products across the line, and all the rest of it. Uh, you know, I, I can absolutely see where where you and your business and your service would would fit into that for the right clients. Fantastic. Yeah, and I think it's important to to understand for advisors that your job is to identify the client at the door. Once they're in the door, then it's then it's a whole different ball game. That's your process. But at yes. that door, you can see, okay, this is a sticky risk insurance client, uh, risk only. I might refer him to another advisor that does advice on risk insurance and, and they're a specialist there. But the reality is the majority of people in Australia don't want advice for some reason or another. Uh, the funniest thing that I've seen in my experience as an advisor is having great relationships with accountants and mortgage brokers and having 
a, a, you know, a hard time getting referrals because they don't want their clients to get advice in the sense because they feel like that's stepping on their toes in some way. So any sort of questioning around their, you know, their situation is awkward for the accountant or the mortgage broker. So our service is is in a great place to you know complement these businesses to say okay well how about we just work as an extension of you because I'm not here to build a relationship with your client uh, I'm not here to understand their family and estate planning needs and wants and tax situation I'm just here to make you look good yes. and how do I do that I, I just I just sign them up to an insurance product and do it efficiently and the client thinks. Oh my God, James is an amazing person. Yeah. Look at this amazing part of his business. I didn't have to stuff around for whatever period of time. So that's the that's the fun part of, of what we do. And a lot of people as well mix it up b- between direct insurance, general ad- uh, general insurance, general advice and direct insurance. Yep. Uh, again, we're not direct. We're just we're just the kindergarten version of a financial planner. <laughs> is, is really how I would say it. Yeah. So we're just there to provide that product. And there's the funny thing is there's hundreds of us you know we, we exist we do business every day but not many of us bother making any sort of noise about it my 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 business is based solely on referrals from other professionals yeah. i don't chase individual clients i don't try to sell insurance i piggyback off your existing expertise and relationship and provide that level of service to your client kind of is it i, I didn't know people like you existed aside from seeing your face pop up on my LinkedIn <laughs> and my LinkedIn feed. Yeah, I, I didn't even know it was a possibility. So there you go. You're educating me and, and everyone else that might be listening at the same time. Look, thanks, Tony. I appreciate you, you you coming along. For anyone that wants to reach out and understand a little bit more, if not work with you, where, where can people find you? Where, where can we where can we track you down? I'm most active on LinkedIn. Yep. Tony Smolevsky. You can spell the surname. You, you win a prize. Sp- do, you want, do you want to spell <laughs> it for everyone? Yeah. Smile, S-M-I-L-E, V for Victor, and Ski, S-K-I, down the mountain. Nice, easy one. Yep. Or Tony Insurance. Perfect. Well, thanks, Tony. Thank you. Appreciate you coming along. Uh, I've learnt a lot. Hopefully, others have too. Thanks for spending some time chatting with us today. Thanks, Heaps, Jack. No worries. This material does not contain and should not be relied on for financial, accounting, legal or tax advice. Schroeder's does not give any warranty as to the accuracy, reliability or completeness of information presented. Visit www.schroeders.com.au forward slash advisors for more information about our funds.